In an earlier screencast, we were looking at a particular example of a flow network with a flow on it, and we were talking about what the flow value was. So just to remind you, here's the simple flow network we were talking about. Um, again, the second number represents the capacity of an edge. The top number represents the amount of flow on the edge. And for this particular example, um, the amount of for this particular example, the amount of flow out of the source is 2 plus 1, which is 3, and that has to be equal to, of course, the amount of flow into the sink, which is 1 plus 2, and that's 3 again. And it, in that uh, last screencast, I claimed that this is actually the maximum flow for this network. And there are two questions here, how to find it, and how do we know if it's maximum. So in this screencast, I'm going to talk about how we find it, um, there's an algorithm called Edmunds Carp, and then in the next screencast after that, I'll talk about how we know that it happens to be the maximum uh, flow. So the algorithm we're going to come up with is based on uh, the, what's called the Ford-Fulkerson method. Um, some people say Ford-Fulkerson algorithm, but it really leaves too many details out to be called a, uh, an algorithm. There are too many different ways to implement it, but at any rate, um, it's what it's based on the idea that you can find up what's called a flow augmenting path, namely it's a path from the source to the sink, along which some additional flow can be sent over and above the flow that already exists in the network. The path is really not in the original graph; it's into in something called the residual graph, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, but. At any rate, the high-level picture of the Ford-Fulkerson method is as follows. You start with a zero flow on every edge, and then you find this flow augmenting path from the source to the sink, and then you use it to adjust the flow along the edges of the path to get a flow of increased value. So if you can find an augmenting path, you're basically guaranteed then that you can increase the value of the flow. And you keep doing this until you can't find a flow augmenting path, and then you know you're done. Well, and that you found the maximum flow. So we'll prove that, as I said, in the screencast after this one. But right now we're just going to focus, focus on an important implementation of the Ford-Fulkerson method. First, though, we have to define what we mean by the residual graph. This is a really key concept, and you really you want to make sure that you understand the details of this. So given some flow, F, which, of course, is defined by the amount of flow over each edge in the graph. Then we're going to define this residual graph by defining the vertexes in the residual graph are the same as the vertices in G. The edge set, though, is what changes. There are two types of edges, forward edges. These more or less correspond to the edges that were in the original graph, but they have different capacities. And what capacity do they have? They have the capacity of the original graph's capacity minus the amount of flow. So forward edges basically have how much room is left in each edge. In addition to forward edges, there are going to be backward edges. So if Eij is an edge and has Xij greater than zero, so in other words, there's flow over the edge, then we're going to define a new edge with weight of what the flow was, but directed in the opposite direction. So in other words, it tends it, it goes backwards, if you will, compared to the original edge. Thus, there is an edge in the edge set of the residual graph with a weight of xij. Okay. Forward edges carry additional flow. Backward edges allow flow to be reduced or reversed. And we'll see how that works in later slides. So now to find an augmenting path for a flow, consider the paths with positive flow R from the source to the sink in the residual graph. If you can find a flow augmenting path that carries R units, then the current flow in the original flow network can be increased by R. And the way you do it, as you'll see in the example we're going to go through, is by increasing the amount of by R on each forward edge and decreasing it by R on each backward edge. This will become clearer when we do the example. 
Now, this idea has important implications. Uh, by assuming the edge capacities are integers, which we did, we know that the actual r is going to be a positive integer, and therefore, on each iteration, the flow value increases by at least one. That means that basically, eventually, we're going to reach the, ma reach the, ma reach the maximum, assuming that the algorithm runs until it finds the maximum. So we know, and we know that it's going to have to stop after a finite number of iterations because that maximum is going to be some finite number. And so by the maximum number of steps it can possibly be is that number. And since the final flow is always maximum, its value doesn't depend on the sequence of augmenting paths used. Now, I've got quite a bit to show yet about this, but this is where we're headed and why this is such an important approach to solving the maximum flow problem. So how is the uh, shortest augmenting path method going to work? That's what we're going to use. It uses basically breadth-first search to find the shortest in terms of number of edges. So this has nothing to do with the weights on the edges. It only it, It's only shortest in terms of the number of edges, augmenting path, and the residual graph. So here's a little more detail on how this works. You start at the source, again in the residual graph, and perform breadth-first search traversal by marking each new ver vertex, unlabeled vertices, with two labels. So we're going to go through basically doing a breadth-first search, and as we go through doing that breadth-first search, we're going to label vertices. And once a vertex is labeled, we're never going to come back to it. So the first label is going to be the amount of additional flow that can be brought from the source to that vertex. And the second label is going to indicate the vertex that's sending the flow to the vertex, and it's going to be labeled with a plus if it's a forward edge that's sending the flow, or a minus if it's a backward edge. Okay, again, this just reiterates in a little more detail what we just said. The source will be labeled with an infinite amount of material, and we're not going to care whether it's a forward edge or a backward edge, because that's we know that's where the material is coming from. But we label it, so we never come back to it. If there's an unlabeled vertex connected to the vertex that we're at, vertex I being processed, uh, by a directed edge from I to J with positive unused capacity, so it's a forward edge, then the vertex is labeled as following with two numbers, Lj and I, plus or minus, plus, because it's forward edge, sorry, where L, what's Lj? Lj represents the amount of flow that can get there from the source, from the, uh, get there from the source. And what is it? It's the mi minimum of the amount that got to the I vertex, right, the beginning of the edge, and the capacity of the forward edge. If the vertex J is connected to I by a directed edge from J to I with positive flow XJI, in other words, we're talking about backward edge. All this may seem a little bit confusing, but this is a backward edge, so it's an edge that's going in the opposite direction of the positive flow. Then the vertex is labeled with, similarly, LJ, where LJ is the minimum of the amount that made it to I and the amount of flow that basically can be pushed back along the backward edge. That's that's this XJI. And you label it with the LJ, and then I came from I, and it was a backward edge. Just come, don't worry if you have, find this confusing at this point. You'll see when we do the example that it's not as confusing as it may first appear. Um, but then make sure you come back here and understand what all the terminology and notation represents. Once the sink is labeled, then we're done in terms of finding an augmenting path. So, and the amount that made it on the augmenting path is indicated by the sink's first label. Remember, that's what we're trying to do at each vertex. Which we, the first label represents how much material can be gotten there from the source. So then the augmentation of the current flow is performed by tracing backwards and following the vertices second labels from the sink back to the source. And current flow quantities are increased on forward edges and decreased on backward edges. So in other words, we're increasing the flow on the forward edges 
and pushing back flow on the backward edges. And then once we've done that, gotten back to the source, then we reinitialize things and attempt to find the next augmenting path. If we can't get to the sink, if there's no augmenting path to the sink and the sink, remain, sink remains unlabeled after, the, after we're done doing breadth first search, then the algorithm returns the current flow as maximum and stops. So this is what we'll have to prove in the next screencast that if we if the algorithm stops, then we have a maximum. So on this slide, I want to go through Edmunds CARP and show how it labels the vertices. So when we start out, we're going to label the first the source. We're going to label that B and a dash. Then we traverse the sources adjacency list. All we're doing is breadth first search and we're doing it in the, basically in the original graph because the flows are zero. And so the first thing on the adjacency list is the second vertex and the amount of flow that can reach there is two. So we're going to label this as two comes from one and it's a forward edge. Now the second thing on its adjacency list is the vertex four so now we're going to label that with the amount that came down from 1, the possible amount, maximum amount, which is 3. It comes from 1. It's a forward edge. So now our Q, remember how breadth first search works, our Q now has 2 and 4 on it. Okay, so the Q over here has 2 and 4 on it. And so now we take the two off the queue and we traverse its adjacency list. So the first thing on its adjacency list is three. So we'll label that. Uh, how much can get there? Well, two made it to the two. And then five is the capacity from two to three. So the minimum of those of five, of five and two is two. It came from the second vertex, two, and it's a forward edge. Then the next thing on 2's adjacency list is the 5. The capacity of that edge is 3, so we'll label 5 with 2, because 2 is the min of 2 and 3, and it came from 2, and it's a forward edge. So now the Q has 3 and 5 on it, and we took 2 off. So now we pull the 4 off, and we see that 4 on its adjacency list has an edge from 4 to 3, but 3 is already labeled. So we don't do anything there. And then we pull 3 off the adjacency list. The only thing on 3's adjacency list is 6. There's capacity of 2 to 6. 2 units made it to 3. So we label 6. 2 uh, comes from 3, and it's a forward edge. And we've now labeled the sink. So we found an augmenting path. Now all the edges were forward edges, but we start here and we take uh, this two came from three and it's forward edge. So we add two to that uh, um, flow. It three came from two and it's a forward edge. So we'll make that two over five. And then two came from one and it's a forward edge. So we'll make that two. So now we have a flow, a non-zero flow on our graph, and we need to form the residual graph for this. So here's the result of all that, um, where everything is clearly labeled. And um, you can see we got, here's the augmenting path. And then what we did was we worked backwards, traced back, made that a two, that a 2, and that a 2. So this is now the state of the world after we've done that augmenting path. And so now we reset, and we're going to start again at the source, and we're going to label the source uh, infinity dash. So now the source is labeled, and we traverse its adjacency list. Now remember, we're in the residual graph, so there's no edge here, or, or you can think of it as an edge having zero capacity. So we can't get to the two, okay? But the second thing on its uh, adjacency list is the edge to four. 
So we can get to four because there's three capa remaining capacity on this forward edge. So now we label four with the amount that can make it to four, which is three. It comes from one and it's a forward edge. So now the only thing on the queue now is four. So now we take four off the queue for the bread first search queue and we look at its adjacency list. It only has one thing on its adjacency list and that's a forward edge and that goes to three. And so now the minimum of three and one is just one. So that's the amount that can go down there. It comes from four and it's a forward edge. So now we're at three and we look, this is really sort of the first interesting thing where we, the uh, residual graph comes into play more obviously. So we're at three, there's no forward edge because the capacity is full. But there is, once we do all the forward edges, there's only this one possibility, then we look at the backward edges. Well here's a backward edge, right? It has capacity two, right? And so what we can do is then we have one unit of flow, so we can send one unit of flow back on this backward edge that's here. And so we label that with one unit from three, and it's a backward edge. And now we can label two. Well, now two is labeled, and two is the only thing on the uh, bread first search queue. So now we take two off the bread first search queue, uh, the only edge of interest really is this forward edge from 2 to 5. And it has capacity 3, but only one unit of flow made it to 2. So we can label 5 with 1, comes from 2, forward edge. And then 5 is the last thing on the queue at this point. And so 5 has a forward edge to 6, and it uh, has capacity of 4, and all, but one unit of flow made it to five, so we'll label six with the min of one and four, which is one, comes from five, and it's a forward edge. So we've now labeled the sink, and so we have an augmenting path, and we can trace back along that augmenting path to augment the flow. So now we're gonna augment the flow, and so we're at the sink, We've got five, um, it, the flow of one came from five and it was a forward edge. So we increase the flow on here. So this, oops, this becomes one, four. And then the one at five, the one that made it all the way is now at five. And so this is a forward edge from two. So this will now become one, three. Now we're at two. Two, the flow came from three, but it was a backward edge. So we reduce this to one, five. Now we're at three. It's a forward edge from four. So we increase this to one, four. And then from four, again, forward edge from one. So we increase this to one, three. So now we have a new flow. And here's the new flow without all, any of my scribbling. And so you can see now we have two flowing here. Basically one comes up here, one comes over here. So this two flow gets split. We send one over to here, and then we're able to send one down here and one up here and get two over there. Now, if we try to run the algorithm again, notice what's gonna happen. The one, has, there's no forward edge here, or has zero capacity. There's a forward edge here. So we'll label, we'll start out when we label the one, and then we'll be able to label the floor, four with two, comes from one, forward edge. But th now the only thing on the queue, at, after you're done with one, is gonna be four. And once we've got four, and we try to go over, look at its adjacency list in the residual graph, this forward edge is full, so there's no capacity, so we can't label three. There's no backward edges, so we're done. We're stuck. 
and so we can we'll be able to prove that this is the max flow value. Right now, I can give you some indication of that. Think about um, this particular way of separating the vertices. Where we're going to separate the vertices one and four, the ones that are labeled, from the rest of the vertices. If we do that, um, we can see that those edges are full. And so it seems reasonable to us to assume that we can't possibly send any more uh, flow between one and six because it, there's no way to cross this boundary that I've indicated. And we'll make that rigorous in the next screencast.